Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to learn about the ISC, everything that you could possibly need to know about it. I'm Brenna, and I'm the Director of Education here at Test Innovators. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so we'll send out a recording afterwards to everyone who registered for the webinar. So if you'd like to go back and reference anything that we talked about today, you'll be able to do that. In addition, if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to type those into the Q&A. And if we have time at the end, I'll answer as many of those as I can. Um, and any that we don't get to, we'll review and send out answers after the webinar uh, with the recording. With that, let's get started just by telling you a little bit about who we are at Test Innovators. We have the leading test prep platform for the ISEE and have helped over 100,000 students uh, get into the most selective schools. And based on that experience, years of experience helping students with test prep, we know that standardized test taking is a skill that you can master and like all skills, you need to learn and practice in order to improve. And when you've mastered this skill, you'll be able to demonstrate all of your knowledge most effectively on the test. Additionally, advances in technology make it far easier to effectively prepare for the test. Technology allows you to quickly identify strengths and weaknesses, and then it provides the best tools to prepare. Those two tenets form the foundation of the tools and resources that we've developed for students to help them prepare for the ISEE, and they also inform the strategies that I'll be sharing with you today um, about preparing for the ISEE. Those strategies come from a few different places, working with admissions departments, feedback from students, families, tutors who use our platform, and additionally from data that's collected in our system. And some of the most important data that we collect are official ISEE test scores and admission results. We've compiled that data and made it available and we'll send out a link to that resource along with the recording of the webinar. This data is important because it tells you what scores will make you a competitive applicant at your target schools? This is an example of what our school's data looks like. Um, if your student was interested in the school, you can see at a glance that scores in the yellow or green bands are generally considered competitive. It is very important to note that there are many parts to the application that will influence admissions decisions, but this can give you good directional information about the ISCE scores that we have found make students competitive applicants. And for students who use our platform to prepare, we also take it a step further and put your practice test scores in the context of your target schools so that you can quickly see how you compare. So in this example, for the first school on the student's list, you can see that my practice scores are looking good for verbal and reading, but I have some work to do on the two math sections, the quantitative and math achievement sections. And then if I click on a different school that I might be interested in, you can see that that changes. So at this school, my practice scores aren't quite competitive yet, so I may have some work to do before my official test. With that, let's talk about preparation. So our agenda date today, we're going to start by talking about the ISEE, an overview of everything that you need to know generally about the test itself. Then we'll talk through some general test strategies and then the sections and some strategies specific to each one. So let's get started. The most important information about the ISEE is what is it and how is it used? And that is simply, it's an admissions test. So your test scores and the ISE essay are used by admission departments. And generally, the most important thing that they're looking for there is to see whether a student will be a good fit at their school in terms of specifically academics generally. The ISE can be taken multiple times. So you can take it once per season, and those seasons are fall, winter, and spring. The most relevant ones really to anyone who's at this webinar and preparing for the ISEE for this application cycle, you'll be able to take the test once in the fall season, so through November, and then you would be able to also take the test one more time in the winter season, which starts in December. Um, our recommendation is always for students to plan to take the test twice. That way, the first test date can serve as a trial. If it goes well, that's perfect and you can be done, but if there's room for improvement and you'd like to try again, there's time and you've prepared so that you have another test date set up and you can do that. So definitely make sure that you are testing by November so that you would have the possibility of testing again in December or January if you want to. 
In terms of format, the ISE can be taken either on paper or on a computer. Um, if you are considering which format might make the most sense for your student, the best thing to do is first to look and see what is available in your area. So um, if there are any scheduling constraints or regional constraints around which format you can use, um, start by looking at that. So if you are definitely going to be taking it on a computer, then make sure that you're practicing on a computer. If you'll definitely be taking the ISC on paper, make sure that you're practicing on paper. If you have the option open to be able to take it either way, recommendation is always to practice both ways and see which one goes better and then sign up for the official test accordingly. Other critical foundational information about the ISE is understanding the different levels. So there's a lower level to the test, that's for students applying to grades five and six, a middle level for students applying to grades seven and eight, and an upper level for students applying to grades nine through 12. And the test structure is pretty similar across those levels, but a little bit different. So I'll start with the middle and upper levels of the test. You have a verbal reasoning section first, then quantitative reasoning, then you have a short break, then reading and math, and then you have another short break, and then you finish with the essay. Um, and the order of those sections is the same for the lower level, but it's just a slightly shorter test. So the verbal section is the same, then the quantitative section is the same, short break, and then the reading section is a bit shorter, the math section is a bit shorter, you have another break, and then the essay is the same length and same type of prompt. And we'll talk more about each of these sections uh, when we get into the section portion. But this is generally what the structure of the test looks like. Um, next natural question is always scoring. So the point allocation for the ISE is that if you answer a question correctly, you get one point. If you answered incorrectly, you get zero points. If you leave a question blank, you get zero points. Um, you'll have noticed that multiple different grade levels of students take the same test. So for the upper level of the ISEE, students applying to grades 9 through 12 are all taking the same test. However, your scores will only compare you to students who are applying to the same grade. You'll receive two primary scores to look at, percentiles and stanines. So a percentile is always a number from 1 to 99, and a stanine is a number from 1 to 9. And I always think it makes the most sense to start with percentiles. Percentiles are saying how you compare to students your age. So a 34th percentile is saying that you received more points in terms of that point allocation part of this than 34% of students your age. Notice that that is not the same as answering 34% of the questions correctly. The ISE is a challenging test, so often actually answering um, a smaller percentage of the test than you might be used to can actually yield um, a reasonably good score. And then transferring that or translating that into stanines, here's a chart that can help under, you understand what stanines are doing. Essentially, it's breaking up a normal distribution. So based on the percentage range, percentile range, you can see what stanine you would get. Um, the main thing that's worth noting here is that families sometimes will feel that a score um, between four and six, you might say, wait, but I, I should be getting a better score than that. Notice that most students get a score that's, that's in that mid-range because that's where this bell curve is falling. That's actually a, a broad range of percent, percentiles goes from state nine four to six. That's 23rd percentile to 76th percentile. All of those students will fall in a state nine from four to six. Um, whereas for instance, a state nine of nine, that's only from the 96th to the 99th percentile. So it's actually, in terms of percentage of the student population, it's a very small percentage, as opposed to a standard of five, which you, know, you have 20% of students fall into that versus 3% you know, fall into that uh, standard of nine. So that can help contextualize the scores that you're looking at. When people talk about ISCE scores, they generally use the STA9 because that's the biggest number that shows up on the score report. So that's what you'll probably expect to be interpreting when you're thinking about scores or talking about scores. So what is a good score? Students often see lower scores on the ISCE than they see on other standardized tests that they take, and that is completely fine and to be expected. It's a small and highly competitive pool of students who are taking the ISCE. And unlike other standardized tests, the ISCE is designed to distinguish top performers as opposed to just determining whether a student has essentially kept up 
with the grade level work that they should have completed at a certain point. So instead of saying, do you know what you should know in sixth grade? It says, how do you compare to other sixth graders, many of whom probably are doing pretty well in sixth grade? So it's a tough test and it's a tough pool. So it's completely fine to see lower scores than you might be used to. And always remember that your applications have many parts. The ISE is just one of them. There are a lot of other pieces that go into your application. That said, should you prepare? Absolutely. Although there are many parts to the application, the test scores are an important piece of it and you wanna make sure you put your best foot forward on every part of the test, every part of your application, excuse me. Uh, additionally, the ISE is a challenging test and preparation will help you do the best that you possibly can on it. Um, and that has a few pieces. Familiarity is a piece of it, knowing what types of questions to expect and how to tackle those, learning some test taking skills so you know how to be strategic about multiple choice tests and how to manage your time effectively. And finally, there are almost certainly going to be questions and content that you haven't seen before and you can learn how to tackle those. Um, so this is an, a learning opportunity uh, that gives you some interesting questions and content areas uh, to learn more about. So how should you prepare? You should always start with a practice test. That essentially serves as your diagnostic. It says, here's where you are, and then you can figure out where to go from there. So you'll find the areas that need work. You'll sort of start with which sections do I want to work on? And then you'll delve into the nitty gritty of exactly which questions you get right and wrong. Look at all the questions you got wrong and make sure you know how to do them if you were to see them again. And then do some extra practice in those areas. So you say, you know, if I missed a question that had to do with um, interpreting a table, I should do a bunch of questions about interpreting tables so I can make sure I've really solidified my knowledge of how to do that type of question. And then after I've done all that practice of the areas I had trouble with, I should take another practice test and see where I am now. So now that you know how to generally prepare, what materials should you use? Of course, we at Test Innovators have spent a great deal of time developing um, ISE prep materials, but wherever you are looking to find um, your preparation resources from, some important things to keep in mind are that you have tests that are accurate and up to date. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're buying a book, make sure that it's a book that isn't about the test, say, 10 years ago, um, since the test tends to change. Make sure that you have normative scoring. Um, as I mentioned before, the ISC is funny in that you can miss a lot of questions and sometimes be doing still pretty well. Without that normative score, it's hard to know really how you're doing. And finally, timing data is huge. So time management is a really important part of the ISCE. Um, and getting information about your time management skills will help you build that important part of your test taking strategy. For example, this is what our timing data looks like from our system. So what you can see here is students will always be able to see um, on the x-axis you have your time, y-axis are the questions in the section, and I can see if I were the student I can look and see I got through all the questions in the section and then I came back and I checked my work on all the questions. So that looks like pretty good time management. Insights like that are critical to helping students become effective test takers and also to foster a reflective process for learning. So with that general information about the test and preparation, let's talk about some strategies. Um, Elimination strategy is always where students should start. The ISE is a multiple choice test and students should always be using the process of elimination. So essentially crossing off answer choices that you know are wrong in addition to thinking about what the right answer is. What that allows you to do is make educated guesses or even find the correct answer. If you cross off three of them and you only have one left, that must be the right answer. Related is when should you guess? Well, there's no wrong answer penalty on the ISE, so Nothing bad happens if you don't answer a question, but you get a point if you get it right, and you have a 25% chance with four answer choices of getting the question right if you guess randomly. So you should always answer, because on average, you'll be getting one question right every four. 25% chance, that's just free points that you don't want to throw away. And our final strategy for the entirety of the ISE has to do with time management. And at the core of this strategy 
is that every correct answer is worth the same number of points. So you get one point for each correct answer, and it doesn't matter if it was a super easy question or if it was a super hard question, they're all the same. So to maximize points, you simply need to answer as many questions correctly as you can, which means that you shouldn't dwell on hard questions because if you spend five minutes on a hard question and instead you could have done five easy questions in that time, it obviously is better to have done the five easy questions. So a good way to think about that is always to group questions by difficulty. So think of questions either as questions that you definitely can do, just you look at them and you say, that's easy, I'll be able to do that fast, or they're hard questions. You're not sure how to get started or maybe it's gonna take a while. In your first pass through the test, only answer those easy questions and you can mark the hard questions to come back to. And only after you've done all those questions that were easy for you, should you come back and work on the hard questions. So a couple other tips that come when it comes to time management. Make sure you're keeping track of time during the test. You should know about how much time you have per question on each section because it varies by section. If you're falling behind, move a little more quickly. If you're rushing through and you have tons of time to spare, go ahead and slow down. Make sure you're not making careless errors. And then of course, just practice. Learn what it feels like to spend one minute versus five minutes on a question so that um, you'll just get in the hang of, of going at about the right pace through each section. With that, let's jump into the specific sections. So we'll start with the verbal section. In the verbal section, for the middle and upper levels of the test, you have 40 questions in 20 minutes. Um, in the lower level, you have 34 questions in 20 minutes. So not quite as many questions. There are two types of questions on this section. First, you have synonyms, and then you have sentence completions. And we'll look at examples of each of those. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about what is at the foundation of the verbal section, which is vocabulary. So if you're working on improving your verbal score, you're gonna start by studying vocabulary. My recommendation is always to study consistently. So set aside 15 minutes every day, put it into your routine so that it's not this big ordeal on one day that you have to spend three hours trying to learn vocabulary. It will be far less effective if you approach it that way. In terms of how you study vocabulary, really just find whatever is a successful method for you. So that could be flashcards, could be writing sentences with words, drawing pictures of the words, studying roots and prefixes and suffixes and breaking words apart. Um, no matter what, I always recommend that you practice using them in conversation though, because that's a good way to make sure you really incorporate those words into your working vocabulary. So here's an example of what a synonym question looks like. As you can see, of course, this is just a vocabulary question. It's saying, here's a word, and which of these four answer choices means the same thing as the given word? So the strategy for synonym questions is pretty straightforward. You always start by covering up the answer choices. Don't look at those first. Come up with your own answer, and then find the answer choice that's closest to yours. And what that prevents you from doing is picking an answer choice that might be sort of related in concept or feel or sound to the given word, but doesn't have the same definition. But if you come up with your own answer first, you're much less likely to make that kind of mistake. And then here's what a sentence completion question looks like. You have a sentence, it has a blank in it, you're picking from these answer choices what should go in the blank and makes the most sense. So when it comes to these, the strategy is pretty similar. Cover up the answer choices first, come up with what should go into that blank, then read your answer in the sentence and make sure it makes sense, and then find the answer choice that's closest to yours, read that one in the sentence to make sure it makes sense, and then go ahead and move to the next question. Some tips that can help you unpack sentence completions, get more of these questions right. Look out for direction words that tell you how the sentence is structured, if they are uh, gonna mean words that mean the same thing or if you're looking for something that's opposite. So words like although, despite, but, though they're telling you, okay, they're going in a different direction, um, each of the clauses, or and, which means, okay, we're in the same place. The overall meaning of the sentence, of course, is always going to be important. You want to make sure you know what this and know and understand what the sentence is saying. Uh, nouns and adjectives tend to be most important in terms of unpacking what a sentence means. Um, and when you're doing that, you'll sometimes even find you might have synonyms for the missing words. Synonyms 
or antonyms, um, and you're just trying to find the word that means that same thing or means the opposite of that. So let's take a look at that example that I had up a second ago. It says the Komodo dragon does not have a blank sense of hearing, which is why scientists originally believed the species to be deaf. So if I were to come up with my own word to go in that blank, I might say it doesn't have a good sense of hearing, because that is why you might have thought it was deaf. So the clues I used for that does not. And then looking at sense of hearing, and then this, this keyword that I thought that they might be deaf. Um, and then I say, okay, good was my guess. And then I go over and look at the answer choices, and I say, okay, A is the closest to my answer. With that, let's jump over into the math sections. So we have two math sections on the ISE, the first of which is the quantitative reasoning section. On the lower level, you have 38 questions to answer in 35 minutes. Middle and upper levels, it's one question less. So very similar. Um, and mathematics achievement, on the lower level, it's 30 questions, 30 minutes. And middle and upper level, it's 47 questions in 40 minutes. So it's a bit longer. So what is the difference between those two math sections? The quantitative reasoning section has more problem solving. Um, and also for middle and upper level students, it also has these quantitative comparison problems where you're given quantities in two columns and you're saying, is column A greater, is column B greater, are they equal, or can it not be determined from the information given? So that's what the quantitative reasoning section looks like. The math achievement section is more knowledge based. Um, so it's usually more likely to be conventional type math that you might see in school, but testing your knowledge of specific vocabulary, say, or specific concepts you might have learned in school. And the subjects that you'll see on both of those math sections, the foundation is always arithmetic, so addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, using negative numbers, positive numbers, fractions, decimals. Um, if any of those sound like they might be weaknesses, that's always a good place to get started with your math preparation. Then algebra features pretty prominently on these sections. You'll have to solve equations. There will be lots of word problems. Um, there's some geometry, so you have to deal with shapes. And then there's data analysis and probability. You'll have charts and graphs and tables to work with. One of the most common things that can happen on the math sections is that students are working quickly under pressure and it's easy to make careless errors. So my primary recommendations are always to make sure that you read questions carefully. And some parts of that, you underline important words and numbers to make sure you're paying attention to the important information. Pay attention to units. So if everything in the problem was given to you in meters but the answers are in centimeters, make sure you're in the right units for the answer. Um, and every single question, after you finish solving, you have the answer. Make sure you go back and check that you answered the question that you were given. It can be really easy. You were supposed to solve for the probability it was not something, but you solve for the probability that it is something. And you get the question wrong, even though you actually knew everything you needed to know to be able to solve it. So taking that two seconds will save you from accidentally getting a question wrong that you actually know how to do. Uh, drawing pictures can also be really helpful for uh, figuring out what a question is talking about. And as every student has always heard many times from their math teachers, remember to show your work. Write your work down. Don't do mental math. It's easy to make mistakes in your calculations if you try to do everything in your head. So make sure you write it down, show your work, and check your work. Some strategies that you can apply across these math sections are to use estimation. So if there's ever a problem that you're not sure about, or a question that you'll know how to solve directly, but you might just take a first step and say, how big do I think my answer should be? And that way, you can also start using that process of elimination to cross off answers that aren't in line with sort of your ballpark for where the answer should be. So estimate on any problem that you possibly can. It's a great strategy. Remember to use the answer choices. So sometimes it can be really tough to figure out how to do a problem just from the question itself, but you may be able to substitute the answer choices or plug in the answer choices into the problem to see which one works. Um, and finally, if you are working, especially when it comes to algebra, so if you have an equation um, or an algebraic expression, if you're having trouble figuring out what's going on, sometimes you can just pick a number 
and substitute that in for the variable and see what happens. So if you can't figure out what's going on, say that x equals two and then see what happens from there. With that, let's jump to the reading section. So the reading section for the middle and upper levels of the test, there are 36 questions in 35 minutes and you have six reading passages. And then for the lower level, it's 25 questions, 25 minutes, and five reading passages. Again, these are all quite similar, but the lower level is certainly a bit shorter. The question types that you'll see on the reading section of the test are main idea questions that ask you to put everything together. Then you have inference questions that say, what can you infer based on the information in the passage? You have tone, style, figurative language questions. Uh, there's vocabulary and context. What does this word mean in line 17? Um, organization or logic questions. And then you have these sort of detail or supporting idea questions. One of the toughest things for many students when it comes to the reading section is time management because you're given long passages and you have to both read the passage and then answer all these associated questions in a relatively limited amount of time. So to help with that, it can be beneficial to work on skimming and underlining. So when you're trying to not read every single word so that you'll be able to get through the passage efficiently, um, it can be helpful to pay attention to repeated words. Any words you see lots of times are probably important to the point of the passage. And first and last sentences generally also help to tell you what the point of that paragraph or sometimes even the whole passage might be. Um, that said, make sure as you're doing this that you don't rush too much. If you start moving so quickly that you really have no idea what the passage is about, that won't be beneficial because you'll end up getting all the questions wrong because you don't actually understand the passage. So practice and figure out what the right pacing is for you so that you can answer as many questions correctly as possible. As you're doing that, some strategies to keep in mind. Make sure you're always finding evidence for answer choices. The key to the reading section of the test is that the answer is always in the passage. So you should always be able to go back to the passage and find the place where it says the answer that you're choosing. And if it doesn't, then you might wanna look at other answer choices. And a second thing, which also we talked about with the verbal section is to think of your own answer before you read the answer choices. And that will help you not get waylaid by something that might sound tempting, but really doesn't mean quite the same thing as what the passage said. You can also use some good elimination strategies for the reading section. Um, one of the best is to, in general, avoid extreme answer choices. Um, anytime you see words like only, always, never, none, best, worst, words like that are pretty extreme. And unless the author of the passage really says that, they are probably more extreme than what the passage is actually trying to convey. So words like usually or most of the time are more moderate and those are more likely to be the correct answer. Um, other things to look for and reasons that answer choices can be wrong is if answer choices are too specific um, or if they're too broad, too general, um, it's, it's not really talking about the focus of the passage anymore. And with that, that brings us to the final section of the ISE, which is the essay. So on the ISE, students are given a personal essay prompt. Um, and this part of the test always gets a lot of questions because it's the only ungraded section of the test. A copy of the essay is simply sent to schools along with ISEE scores and admissions departments use it for a couple different things. So they use it as an indicator of the student's writing ability. It's really their only truly authentic piece of writing that was just the student sat there and they came up with what they wanted to say in a room all by themselves. Um, and that means it tells you about their writing ability and it also tells you about what's important to them. So what pops into that student's mind when they're sitting there by themselves without any other outside influences and they decide to write something about themselves. Um, so from a school's perspective, application essays can be edited and influenced extensively by parents, siblings, friends, tutors, but the ISE essay is really a pure sample of a student's writing. So what do they choose to write about? How do they express those thoughts? So it's pretty important to admissions departments because of those things. So the things that you should think, keep in mind as you're writing that essay, which matters, are to show your personality. Think about the things that are important to you, what you value, and make sure that you show that off um, in your essay. 
make sure that you have a good structure. A good way to get started on that is always to outline before you start writing. Make sure you know what your main point is and what your supporting ideas are gonna be, which will be your body paragraphs. Um, and then make sure you have good supporting details and examples that help your essay come alive for the admissions department as they're reading it. And finally, of course, you want to be putting your best foot forward. So make sure you save a few minutes to edit your writing, check your mechanics, make sure you use correct spelling, capitalization, punctuation, and grammar throughout. With that, we've talked a lot about all of the different sections, many different strategies. So let's end with a recap of best preparation practices. So as you're doing this, always start with a full length practice test. Use that to identify your strengths and weaknesses. Review your scores in the context of your target schools to see where you're looking for improvement. And then learn content and strategies in those areas. Practice, practice, practice. We are here to help throughout that process. Go ahead and visit our website to access all of our materials and resources. And if you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to reach out to our support team at this email and phone number. Um, and we would love to help you through the application process. Um, and with that, I'm gonna see if there are any questions that I've had come up during the webinar. I'm not seeing any. So thank you again for joining this evening. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out and best of luck in the process.